What's up photographers? Welcome to my home studio. This is a place where I'll be recording the majority of my home tutorials if um, we ever want to do any hands-on instruction. Um, these tutorials will all be live on YouTube and they'll kind of run parallel to what's going on in the classroom studio spaces. I'll also be recording quite a bit of uh, screen capture tutorials, especially when we're doing a lot of um, image scanning or Photoshop work. Uh, but for today, uh, we've got some introductory stuff to cover. Like for example, what's in that photography kit that we got? Um, sort of a basic introduction to the camera as a piece of technology. And um, by the end of the tutorial, we're actually gonna get into um, the process of graining our own uh, ground glasses so that um, we can build our own cameras. Uh, so let's actually start kind of at the beginning here and work our way towards it. Now in the kits, um, I've got some stuff that is going to be sort of supplementary to what we're doing throughout the semester. Um, there's obviously some stuff that you need beyond what's in this kit. I'll start with what I've given you first, and then we'll talk about what uh, you need to provide for yourselves. I'll, um, maybe the obvious stuff on top here uh, would be that I'm going to have um, you guys shoot your own roll of film this semester and hand process it. Um, so I've provided uh, you guys with a roll of Ilford HP5. This film is um, 35 millimeter film. Uh, so if you happen to find an old uh, 35 millimeter camera at home or you have one or you know somebody who you might be able to borrow it from this is the kind of film that the um, the kind of early SLR cameras uh, sort of ran on. If you actually have uh, a camera that takes 120 film or something else you can turn this in to me and um, I'll get it for you kind of within reason. It's got to be able to um, be processed by hand uh, with the uh, ID11 processing that we have. So um, the, the HP5 films, the Kodak Triax films, that's great. No color film, uh, at least um, not for this project. I have no problem with you guys shooting color film this semester, and actually we have a relationship with a lab just down the street from the school uh, where we can get that taken care of for you, no problem. Uh, set that film aside. Don't even open it until we come to the film project. Uh, it's best to uh, leave it in a place that's relatively cool and dry. Uh, some people even store their film in the refrigerator. That's not necessary for right now. And you've also got a couple of other oddball things. Uh, maybe the most obvious thing in your art kit, uh, in your uh, photography kit, would be our lens cloth. Now, because photography uh, of all kinds, whether that's iPhone photography or like me uh, recording using, um, you know, some of these uh, webcams, um, I'm constantly using uh, lens cloths to clean surfaces. Now, the surface of your lenses uh, is really critically important. Most of the time, the lens is the most important and most expensive part of the camera itself. So you don't want to grab just anything around your studio. You don't want to grab your T-shirt and uh, and rub the front of that lens. Um, I recommend using uh, the lens cloth that I've provided for you. I really like these um, eucalyptus ones uh, or eucalyptus cloth. Uh, they tend to work the best for me at grabbing oils and things off the lens. They're washable. Uh, they're great. Uh, now, I use them so much that uh, I have to be really careful because I have a lot of dirty old lens cloths floating around. I want to make sure that I don't bring a dirty lens cloth to a nice clean lens. Uh, what that dirt is in the lens is often or in the lens cloth is oftentimes finger uh, um, finger grease or grease off the ring of a camera lens or even grit and sand. Uh, so just because it's a microfiber cloth doesn't mean it's going to be good for your lens. Uh, always a good idea to have some fresh ones around. Now also in the art kit, I've got the, um, the glass graining kit for you guys. Uh, two pieces of, of glass that I've cut and ground for you. Uh, already, or that I've cut and uh, sort of polished off the edges for you. I have um, a little bit of 600 grit. It's actually like rock polishing compound, uh, but it's carborundum grit that we'll use to grain uh, the surfaces of the glass. Uh, we'll get to that at the end of this video. And um, I've got a Fresno lens in your kit. Uh, this is going to help us with our homemade cameras, but you also may find some interesting uses for it. Um, these are sort of thin plastic lenses that um, sort of work a bit like magnifying glass, uh, but they're not, they, they sort of have the same optical qualities as some of what's going on in the camera. You also have a piece of white cardboard that we'll use as an image plane in our cameras. Um, you've got a couple of uh, pairs of nitrile gloves. Now we're going to be doing things um, 
uh, with chemistry later on this semester, photochemistry, so uh, the nitrile gloves aren't a bad way to keep that off your hands. Uh, but some of you guys may also want to use it when we're graining the glass just to keep the, um, the carborundum grit out of your skin. Um, I'm not going to use it. It's not a big deal. It generally washes off. Uh, but it's the kind of stuff that if you're going right from, say, um, graining your ground glass in the studio to lunch, uh, you're going to have to do a really good job with soap and water or just wear the gloves and that um, that'll take care of it for you. And then also, uh, this black plastic tray is just going to kind of be a nice way to mix up our cyanotype solutions. Now, I didn't give you the cyanotype solution yet. Uh, I'm going to get that in the... Uh, I'm going to have that shipped to school relatively soon, and I'll make sure that everybody gets it when it comes time. Uh, but that'll be an addition uh, sort of down the road for your art kits. Uh, so for now, the majority of this stuff can just kind of live in that art kit, and, uh, and we'll kind of talk through some of the things that you have to provide for yourself. Now, obviously, as a photography class, you got to provide your own cameras. Um, uh, we're going to talk uh, film traditional cameras, analog cameras today, but just about everything you take this semester is going to be digital. Uh, so you have to provide your own DSLR or at least a camera that can, um, you can have some manual control over it. Manual control specifically here means focus, uh, shutter speed, and aperture, hopefully ISO as well. Uh, now, because you have to shoot a roll of film this semester too, I'm going to put you on a little bit of a uh, scavenger hunt to try to find uh, um, an analog camera to do that with. Something that has all of the manual controls would be great. I know that there were, my whole childhood was rife with uh, sort of point and shoot film cameras. Um, that, you know, that could work, but it's not going to be nearly as rewarding an experience for you um, as shooting a roll of film on a manual camera. They're slow, they're clunky, they're hard, you're limited to 36 exposures, um, but all of the learning that happens here will translate over really well over to what's going on in Photoshop, what's going on in your DSLR, and what's going on with camera developments now that um, it sort of helps frame that whole context. Now, because this is primarily a digital course, uh, we're going to be in Photoshop a lot. Uh, that means you got to have a laptop or at least at home a desktop computer that can run the software. I'm going to provide you a free copy of the software uh, as long as you can get it downloaded from the Adobe site. Uh, but you got to be able to come prepared with a laptop that's ready to go. Let me know if you're having a hard time installing it. Um, there are a lot of things we can do to make the installation process faster. There's a lot of things we'll talk about in class to actually speed up your laptop. Uh, if it's kind of laggy, bogging down a lot, and you struggle with it, um, let's talk this semester. This can be not just a class about photography, but also um, sort of a class about you know how to organize your life digitally and how to maintain your tech. Photographers tend to be kind of gearheads, right? Like uh, just about every photographer you know at some point is going to start talking about not, not only their camera, but some other bits and pieces of gear that they've got sitting in their kit. Um, so let me say this. You generally don't need a lot of the extra stuff that you know photographers carry around, but um, they make certain types types of photography uh, easier. Um, say, for example, you really want to go out and take pictures of the sky at night. Uh, a tripod is going to be really handy for that. I don't know many people who go out and freehand shoot pictures of the sky. Uh, you just can't get that kind of stability that a tripod gives you. Uh, for that matter, the sharpness, right? Um, also, just sort of basic stuff like uh, some sort of bag to carry your camera around in, or cameras if you carry more than one. Uh, bags do a couple things. They keep your kit contained so it's easy to grab and go. Uh, they also protect it when you drop it, so, you know, bump it around in the hallway, something like that. <clears throat> if you have questions about, you know, other things you might be able to add to your kit to sort of make certain types of photography easier, um, my kits are probably way bigger than they need to be. I've got a variety of different kinds of cameras. Uh, everything that's, you know, everything from the sort of cutting edge, fairly new digital stuff to uh, cameras that essentially mark the beginning of photography. So um, uh, I'm excited to kind of see what you guys are bringing into class. Um, I'm excited to see how you kind of run with some of this analog information and uh, this kind of exciting exploration of what cameras are and how they work. So let's actually talk about that a little bit, and um, it'll this this will be the primer for our um, our making your own camera project. Now, uh, to understand sort of the basics of 
of what's going on in the camera. I'm going to use this old Nikon. This is a Nikon F. It's a really classic, wonderful camera um, because it's it's fairly straightforward to sort of see all of the parts. I can take it apart and show you a few things. Uh, but cameras basically work this way. Imagine sort of holding the camera here, right? All the light is passing into this front barrel on the front of the uh, on the front of the camera. This barrel is loaded with glass elements, so we call this the lens. But embedded in the lens is not just the lens elements, which are responsible for, say, focusing the image, uh, but you've also got an aperture ring on these old lenses, and an aperture ring opens and closes like the pupil of your eye. So you're not only shaping the light with the focus, uh, but you're controlling the amount of light that's passing into the camera. Then somewhere at the back of the camera here, right, that's where the image is focused and recorded. In the case of this old camera, uh, that is uh, you know, in the back here, that's where your film would be. Now, on this camera, this is an SLR camera, and what that means is essentially you've got a single lens with light passing in, uh, but at some point, that light is being bounced up and into this big block on top called a pentaprism so that I can actually see what the lens is seeing. If you notice, the eyepiece and the lens are not in plane with each other. Well, that's because you've got, you know, your negative back here or your image recording place or on your DSLRs, this would be where your, um, your uh, CMOS or sensor is, your, your digital sensor. And that's the most direct sort of pathway for light to travel into the lens and onto the sensor. Uh, but it doesn't work very well to be looking through the eyepiece and not seeing exactly what the lens sees. And so uh, one of the great innovations of the SLR cameras was they were able to bounce the light up. And the way that they were able to do that, I can show you by popping the lens off here, is by bouncing it off of a reflex mirror. If you open up the front of your uh, either your DSLR or SLR camera, you'll see sort of an angled mirror in the inside there, and that angled mirror bounces the, uh, bounces the image that's coming in off the lens up onto a piece of frosted glass. That frosted glass is the ground glass. That's the image plane that you see when you look through the eye hole in the back of the camera. So one of the really great things uh, I find about opening up these old cameras is you start to get sort of an appreciation for what it is uh, that that tech is all about. Now, why all this chatter about, you know, SLR, single lens? I mean, were there ever cameras with multiple lenses? And the answer is, well, yes, absolutely. Um, one of the cameras I've been shooting with almost exclusively now for the last year is this twin lens Rollacord camera. Uh, it's actually really easy to demonstrate here because I have a very clean view of what's going on on the ground glass. One of the lenses here is designed for taking pictures uh, and recording it on the negatives. The negatives are again back here on the back of the image or on the back of the camera near the image plane. The other lens is for seeing and focusing. So this lens, this camera has what's called a waist level finder. I'd look down into the ground glass and I manipulate my focus until the image looks uh, looks clear and then I take the picture. Now a stacked lens like this technically isn't exactly recording what I see, not quite as accurate as say the uh, SLR camera which you know records exactly what's coming in through the lens, uh, but it was close enough and because this camera is a 120 camera the negatives were so big uh, when they were designed essentially if, if you were off by a little bit. Um, the pictures were so big they assumed you would just sort of crop them back. Now there were a whole line of cameras that also um, didn't have uh, twin lenses or didn't have a single lens reflex. Uh, they were called range finders or in this case um, this one uh, looks a little bit like another camera I have, the Agfa Isolette, but this one is an Ansco Speedex. I have no idea what the quality of this camera is. It was given to me and I've never used it, but uh, you can see how it actually has some bellows that pull out. This was sort of um, a transitional camera on its way to, you know, the technology developing to the point where an SLR camera had all of the kind of compacted here, but if you notice, it's got um, a lens up on the front, uh, but really no way to bounce that image up, and so it has just a teeny tiny little eyepiece that comes through a lens on the front of the camera, and uh, it was an approximate image, right? You kind of looked through the little eyepiece, it gave you a sense 
sense of roughly what you were um, taking a picture of, you had to be very careful to uh, either estimate or uh, measure the distance of your subject from the camera uh, because your focus ring is set up uh, by feet or meters. And so um, if you were off in estimating it, your picture was out of focus because um, this little eyepiece, right, is, uh, is just a teeny lens that's not connected at all to the actual image that's making the camera. Now there are still plenty of cameras out there that use this sort of sort of separate eyepiece rangefinder style, range finder style um, uh, eyepiece. It's a very simple camera. It's very compact. Uh, it compared to the sort of clunkiness of the SLR and the amount of mechanics that went into this, uh, some of these early um, box camera like with the bellows uh, were very simple cameras and the, the camera we're going to make is um, sort of more like this camera here with the bellows than it is like our SLRs. So to actually describe just a little bit more clearly like what's going on in this SLR camera as lights coming in. Uh, it's helpful to sometimes make goofy like simple little illustrations right so the dark box of the camera is really you know where you know all the magic happens. If you open the box of a camera like this your film gets ruined right. Hiding back here at the back of the camera is your image plane and think of that as either your image sensor your digital sensor or maybe that's the film tucked way back there. Now hanging off the front of the camera right we got this really great looking lens and uh, inside the lens are well lenses so imagine right your um, you know shaped pieces of glass up there in the front of the lens but then also an aperture which is sort of an opening and closing wall so you've got two things going on out there but then you've got this angled piece of glass that's your reflex mirror and your ground glass which is sort of hiding right here in the plane and then something that's roughly shaped like a triangle on the top here and it's stored inside of that little triangular shaped uh, kind of mounting on the top of your camera is what's called a pentaprism. So as light travels into the front of your camera it gets shaped, it gets decreased in the amount, it hits that uh, reflex mirror and is bounced up into the pentaprism, bounces a couple of times so that by the time it comes out that little eyepiece and into your eye, uh, what you're seeing is exactly what the lens is seeing. When you push the trigger on your camera, this little reflex mirror snaps up out of the way and all of that light then falls onto your uh, light sensitive material, either film or um, either film or sensor. Now there's also a shutter hiding in here and it's probably easiest to pop the lens off this camera again and take one more look at what's going on. So right inside of this camera lens we've got everything from uh, focusing elements, the glass that moves kind of back and forth to focus the image. You've got an aperture ring on the inside that goes click 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 and either opens or closes very much like the pupil uh, in your eye. We'll have to set that aside and then inside your camera itself and this is where the lighting may get a little tricky because it's dark in there. It's dark in there on purpose, right? Uh, but there's a mirror that's angled, a bit of an angle and if I look up on top there is my ground glass. If I pop that uh, camera body open again and obviously you wouldn't do this if there were film in that camera uh, you get to see the shutter curtains. Now I'm going to wind this film, advance this uh, shutter, load the shutter and click it open so that you can see that when, uh, when you're taking a picture the light that passes through the lens falls straight through the body of the dark box of the camera and would land on the surface of the film back here. That would have been incredibly long shutter speed. I've got my camera set to the shutter speed called B or bulb, which means as long as my finger is on that trigger, the shutter stays open. Comparatively, if I turn the shutter speed up, 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 up to say something like a 500th or 500 is usually how that says, you'll see how much faster that is. Barely register it with my eyes. Not even sure how that'll show up in the video, right? Now, that tiny little image plane up on top is where the image is being focused. Again, uh, 
in my twin lens camera, it's a bit easier to imagine this process. You can probably barely make it out just in the inside. Look, a cardboard box that's coming in and out of focus. Now that image plane is not a digital screen, which all of us are accustomed to seeing. Uh, that image plane is light falling on a piece of ground glass. So at this point in the tutorial, let's actually get down to making something. Now the ground glass in your camera is not necessarily a special, you know, optically pure kind of glass at all. Um, in fact, it's probably a, just a standard piece of glass. If it's an older camera, standard piece of glass that has been either chemically etched or, well, like we're going to do today, mechanically etched or grained. What I did in preparation for your project, uh, uh, for this project for you guys, is I literally just cut up uh, some old panes of glass that I had sitting around my studio into smaller pieces, and um, they were clear at one point. And what we're going to do is put a small amount of, um, essentially it's sandpaper without the paper, uh, some of that carborundum grit on the glass, and we're going to grain two pieces of glass together. It's going to take us probably between 10 and 15 minutes to get a nice uh, to get a nice grind on it, and when uh, and when we're done, we'll rinse it off and uh, dry it and check it to make sure that the grain is even, and that will be the beginning of our camera, which we'll kind of pick up in the following tutorials. A couple of things that I'll say before uh, we start graining is make sure you have enough time to do this start to finish. You cannot come back easily to this project. You're going to need uh, a piece of paper uh, to work on so that you don't. Um, so that you don't get any of this carborundum grit anywhere else. Um, if those of you guys who've done some traveling with your cameras, you know about um, being careful not to get any dust in your camera. Uh, dust and sand can do like you know absolutely terrible things, especially to the moving parts of what's going on in your camera. Now, if dust and sand is sort of hard and damages your camera, now carborundum grit is hard enough to sand metal and glass, which means it is exactly what you don't want in your camera. Be very, very careful then about where that carbon number grid goes. You don't have very much. We're going to keep it right on your work surface on a piece of paper, and then we'll uh, either throw it away or wash it down the drain when we're all done. To begin this graining process, um, find a piece of paper. You can rip something out of a sketchbook, that's fine. I've got this yellow piece of paper here, which is going to make it a little easier for you guys to see what's going on. And go back to your photography kit and grab the uh, two pieces of glass and the 600 grit carborundum page. Now, uh, it's in, sort of folded into a piece of white paper. Let's leave that aside for a moment and uh, get out your, uh, your two pieces of glass. These are relatively small. It shouldn't take too long to grain these, uh, but comparatively, they're pretty large uh, from, you know, compared to what's probably in your camera. If you've got a, sort of a modern SLR, digital SLR camera, you probably got a piece of ground glass in your camera that's, you know, maybe two thumbs or so big. These are going to be a little bit larger, big enough that we'll be able to kind of make our cameras work. Uh, it's probably not a bad idea to just sort of tear this open and uh, very, very carefully make sure that uh, you're only getting this kind of black or grayish carborundum grit onto your work surfaces. Uh, if you are concerned about sort of um, getting it onto your hands and getting it into your food, or maybe if you've got your phone out and you're trying to work your phone as well, you don't want to bring that carborundum grit to your phone screen. It will scratch. Uh, so you could potentially wear these gloves. Um, I'm not going to wear mine because I don't have anything in my studio here that's going to get damaged by the grit, um, and I want to save my gloves for processing film later on. The last thing that you're going to need for this is a little bit of water. I happen to have a small spray bottle here for uh, for this project. Um, you wouldn't necessarily need a spray bottle, but uh, it's handy because um, as we're graining uh, the uh, the two pieces of glass, uh, the water will help keep the grit on the glass surface itself, and um, and it will keep the glass moving. So I'm going to pre-wet my uh, my piece of glass here, give it a couple sprays, light sprays of water, and then sift it just like it was like some salt and pepper at a cheap restaurant on the side of the road or something like that. So uh, a light coat, you probably won't even need all of it right off the bat. Then stack those two pieces of glass like a sandwich. And it probably take a second to kind of get the right feel for it, but you're gonna let those two pieces of glass just sort of sandwich into each other. Now, that sound is a little bit like, um, you know, fingernails on a chalkboard, so it might drive you crazy, but uh, we're going to give that about 5, 10, 15 minutes worth of work. Um, 
as I'm working, I'm paying attention to see that I've got grit all over the whole piece of glass. Um, I might rotate the glass a little bit to make it happen. If it's starting to get real sticky and dried out, I'll grab a little bit more water and, uh, and hydrate it. Now, what you end up here uh, when you're, you know, committing 5, 10, 15 minutes to this is you're getting a more and more even and consistent grind. I mean, you probably laid some pretty good scratches into your glass right away and then eventually you start to polish them out. But you're never really going to see what's going on there until you rinse it and dry it. Um, so you can see the mess here that's on the table that uh, we're going to just gonna fold up into this piece of paper. Uh, you probably have leftover grit. You can just tape that closed and maybe use it again for more glass in the future. But um, I'm going to rinse these off in the sink and sort of see how I'm doing. Uh, I'll catch up with you guys in the studio uh, and we're going to start to install these in our handmade cameras and, uh, and see how we're doing.